financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host, Shane and Kyle, as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vonnie. You're listening to the Vonnie Podcast. And welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion, or as close as you can be, at least. I'm Shane, and... I'm Kyle, baby. You, you always seem to step that up, although I guess that's... Uh... That's that's good, right? You know, <laughs> differences and all. Keep but, it fresh. <laughs> keep it fresh. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but we're certainly glad you decided to join us today, and we hope you've had a great week. Uh, but that said, Kyle, why don't you go ahead and Bipcot this thing for us? The Vanu podcast is covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. Good job. You sound good, too. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> yeah, this episode is entitled Libertarians and Coercivists, and the show notes can be found at vonniepodcast.com forward slash eight. There you can find the article we'll read and comment on if you're interested in following along. But first, I want to thank you for the terrific support since the launch of TVP. Some individuals are truly looking for solutions, and they have found a home here. That, and we are the only two folks discussing this potential freedom strategy, at least consistently. There's literally no competition, <laughs> at least as of yet. We'd also like to take a moment to thank Travis again for his hardware donation. It will be the first time it is used in this podcast. That said, good evening, Kyle. Uh, how are things going? Well, yeah, I too would like to thank Travis for his uh, for his Bitcoin donation, which made the technical capabilities here possible with the new microphone. So again, hats off to Travis. Indeed, indeed. So uh, on top of what I've already mentioned uh, just now, you've, you've already been interviewed on the subject of Vani once, and uh, I will be joining Philip Frey, the host of the Valiant Growth podcast, here soon for an extended interview. Uh, he, uh, typically, his interviews are a little shorter, and I kind of, I kind of mentioned that to him, and he, and he said, uh, I'm not against uh, doing an extended interview, and I was like, okay, it's cool. I have like a, you know, a couple hours, and he's going to give me four hours if I need it. So, uh, <laughs> so if you want a little bit more of a condensed version, uh, <laughs> that might be might be something that you're interested in. We'll play that sometime here, uh, for for TVP as well. So yeah, Kyle, the the interest in Vanu is is definitely there. You know, as we as we kind of figured it would be. Well, yeah, I think people are really trying to look for any sort of real strategies that can help them uh, achieve liberty in their lifetime, so to speak. And considering the concomitant series of failures whether it be political crusading or reformism more, more precisely, uh, or, or much of a lot of other things that have come and gone, I think people are really willing to try something different. Or, as is the case with Vanu specifically, something that was done before, uh, but unfortunately didn't gain a lot of traction at the time, and in a lot of ways we're trying to kind of bring it back. Indeed we are. Indeed we are. So, lastly, make sure to go grab your free copy of Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. Again, Kyle and I took the liberty of digitizing it in both PDF and audiobook format. So, if you're more of a visual person, go download the PDF. And if you're someone that wants to listen on your commute to and from work or whatever, uh, the audiobook is there for you. And it's free. Again, it's free. So, there, you don't have to pay us anything. Just go download it. Go listen to it. Uh, it's all good. It's all good. Just visit vonnypodcast.com and click on the second tab, Free Vonnie Book. It's pretty self-explanatory. You literally can't miss it. So tonight we'll be discussing an article by Rayo titled Libertarians and Coercivists. It was originally published in the third issue of the Eleutherian Forum on January 16th, 1967. So as usual, we're hopping back in the time machine to see what he had to say on these very important ongoing issues. You ready to get started, Kyle? Yep, let's, uh, let's get her done. Quote, a libertarian is a person who holds for whatever reason that no one has the right to use coercion, initiate the use of physical force, or threat thereof. Most libertarians hold that one may use physical force in self-defense and or retaliation against coercion, distinguishing between coercion and non-initiated force appropriate to a situation. The opposite of a libertarian is a coercivist, a generic term for persons who inflict or advocate coercion. Two main subcategories of coercivists are felons who personally coerce others, and status who seek organized coercion by a state. 
So uh, I'll just kind of stop there. Pretty self-explanatory. He's kind of you know laying out the very, very brief foundation in, in his very, very uh, quick, succinct way. But uh, anyways, quote, most conventional political categories are simply different varieties of statism. Quote, rival gangs of looters who fight over who has the right to coerce and for what purposes coercion may be used. These include, one, socialists who advocate government ownership of major industries, fascists who advocate government regulation and taxation of private business, three, conservatives who advocate government regulation in accordance with tradition, four, liberals, not to be confused with classical liberals, who advocate economic equalization through coercion, states' rights activists who prefer coercion by small states at a local level, one-world advocates who prefer coercive control of the entire earth by a single government, nationalists who advocate coercion which increases the power of a particular state, and lastly, racists who advocate coercive subjugation of certain races. And uh, I'll stop there. I'll, I'll end that quote there for a second. But I really like that he, you know, made the distinction between, between cl- liberals and classical liberals because this is something that frustrates me. Uh, you know, the people that, uh, you know, would probably, you know, consider themselves classical liberals, you know, kind of bastardizing the name that they kind of, you know, that's kind of was the foundation of what they kind of believe in, right? Yeah, and I've described myself in the past publicly as, you know, a liberal, you know, the real kind. And of course, I, I was referring to the, to the classical one, which actually cared about the evolution of human liberty and at least had, if maybe not an, ex- an exclusive devotion to the free market, at least a, a unique appreciation for it and such. And in a lot of ways, it traces back to uh, – you could either go to John Locke, who was the founder of classical liberalism, especially in Second Treatise of Government, or even to the levelers in the 16th century in England – uh, because they were pretty much kind of pushing something very similar. Indeed, indeed. But yeah, I just want to mention the fact that I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, that he actually made the distinction because because a lot of people don't do that today. It's uh, it's it's libtards. It's, yeah, libtards. It's, I mean that that's that's what the alt right's been doing lately. They just anybody who disagrees with the alt right, which is basically just you know his wannabe Majesty the shiny rugs's cheerleading section for the president, of course. Uh, anybody who disagrees with the alt right is now a libtard. And, of course, that's a portmanteau of liberal retard, which has nothing to do with liberalism and has everything to do with people who advocate for the welfare state. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess to kind of wrap that up, specificity is important. And, uh, yeah, I definitely like that he uh, was very specific there, which he's, he, that's kind of how Rayo was. He made sure to define all of his terms be- beforehand. But, uh, quote, these categories are by no means mutually exclusive. Thus, the American government might be, might be described as predominantly fascist liberal nationalist. Uh, so I'll stop there. That's an interesting way that he uh, he put that. You know, I, I I don't know. Like, what would you call it if you had to describe it? Because I think fascist liberal nationalist uh, is a little little wordy. <laughs> yes, it is. I think maybe what he was trying to say is that it's authoritarian, right? Because if you look at even from his list, if you look at, well, the socialists really are the same as the uh, the libtards who are not liberals. Uh, I mean, they're, 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 that's the same side. And then, of course, the fascists are the same as the conservatives. I yeah, mean, I would, I would even say, you know, the nationalists and the racists. I mean, that kind of I mean, not not all nationalists are racist. But uh, I mean, uh, if you look at kind of like the, the alt right national, like the clamoring for nationalism, I mean, uh, it, it's definitely it's definitely there, uh, you know, in some areas. Well, yeah, I think that's just kind of obvious. And even some like YouTube comments that have gone public lately uh, would have like some commenters saying on various videos regarding, you know, the Portland protests and all that, that uh, something along the lines of, well, a nation is a race, a race is a nation. So in a lot of so there's even people trying to equivocate the two now. And and those wow. guys are pretty much part of the alt. Yeah, this is kind of more recent news. But yeah, I mean, that's part of the alt right, too. And so it's it's just kind of, you know, I, I kind of <laughs> It's all the collectivism. It's the collective movementism. Just one more time is really what all that is. And it's now just expressing itself in these, you know, different ways that Rayo is just trying to make sense of. But also something else I want to point out too. Notice too the states' rights advocates and then the one world advocates. Uh huh. Yeah. Now this is rather interesting. So arguably the people who would essentially be the constitutionalists, the limited government people. I thought a lot of them were in favor of states' rights, weren't they? The Tenth Amendment? Well, yeah, they used to be, yeah. (laughs) 
I, I, I'm, I'm talking about before Trump. Yeah, yeah, de- yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, 10th Amendment, 10th Amendment, 10th Amendment, yeah. Yeah, so would that mean that those states' rights advocates are actually authoritarians and the and therefore a rival gangs of looters? I don't know. I mean, there's a more of the typology which which Ray will get into, but just just have this one portion of it, this one particular list about the rival gangs of looters. I mean, Ray is already finger pointing the states' rights advocates. So all the well, people, well, yeah, it's it's essentially. I mean, it's essentially you know more more benevolent rather than you know just the like the outright violent like the socialists and fascists tend to be. So uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just a, it's a more cuddly version, uh, which is why I think he kind of included it because it, I, I would say it is kind of on the spectrum. Yeah, it is. And also a lot of the people who are cheering things like state nullification, <clears throat> Dr. Tom Woods, uh, people che- you know, cheering on state nullification, people cheering on, oh, the constitutional sheriff thing. Oh, Sheriff Mack and all those people, right? Uh, versions on a theme, the Oath Breakers and others, like all of those guys. I mean, aren't those like, again, it's kind of like a limited government thing one more time, but, they're, but they also say states' rights at the same time. And yeah, the way that Rayo f- defined it here about where they prefer coercion by small states at a local level, I don't know about you, man. I think he nailed it. Oh, yeah. But it also kind of casts aspersions on 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 the minarchists, at least to some degree, because they usually do tend to be really big on on like the, the 10th Amendment issues and so forth. Well, yeah. And I mean, yeah. And, and even in uh, uh, in previous broadcasts, we've been we've discussed his his viewpoints. And it was it was the uh, collective movementism one. He he's, he was he had some concerns with, you know, both limited government libertarians, which would be the minarchists uh, and also, you know, anarcho capitalists. But that's not really relevant here yet. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he, he kind of already kind of uh, is, is very, very skeptical. Uh, of them to begin with, so I'm not surprised at all that he, you know, tossed that in there, uh, you know, on, in that group of uh, rival gangs, rival looters. Yeah, and also on the one world advocates one, so that's co- coercive control of the entire earth by single government. You know, it's interesting for anyone who bothered to read Hans Hermann Hoppe's Democracy: The God That Failed. One of the major arguments that Hoppe a- uh, basically postulated as as part of his overall thesis in that book was essentially that people who promote democracy. And because of his, uh, and because of how he was applying the Austrian school, uh, school's notion of time preference to democracy itself as a form of government, that essentially it does uh, the way that he kind of reasoned it out was essentially is that anyone who basically pushes for democracy basically wants a centralized government, the inevitable result of which would be a new world order. Yeah, a global yeah, the, yeah, the, the, global logi- the logical inclusion. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can, I, I can, I can see where he's going with that. I, I haven't read that book, but it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting, uh, it's an interesting, you know, inclusion statement. Yeah, statements, yeah, premise, yeah, and, and so yeah. it, and it's, and it's kind of, and it's kind of a little bit uncomfortable. So while he does list here socialists, fascists, conservatives, uh, let's just call them the anti-liberal liberals, uh, states' rights people, the one world, the nationalists, and the racists. You know, it's an interesting list he's got there about the rival gangs of looters, but I'm just simply suggesting to the listeners that maybe there's an implication there, at least regarding some of them there, that are a little bit uncomfortable. So even if you're outside the left-right paradigm, which would be that socialist, fascist, conservatives, and then, you know, anti-liberal libtards, if you will, uh, welfare, welfare statists, that still, I mean, there's the nationalist. I don't know about you, man, but every single American patriot I've ever talked to is a nationalist. It's kind of it's kind of a requirement, right? America first. <laughs> yeah, flag waving much. And my favorite part is, I, hell, you wrote that series uh-huh. uh, on on, on, the, the, on the, the the flag trilogy. Yeah, the flag trilogy. Yeah, and and how you discovered that you know many people, uh, the, the patriots included. Although not limited to them, are actually accidentally committing civil disobedience because they're outright uh, violating Title IV flag code, depending on how they display the flag in certain ways versus others. And jail time was involved too, so it's a criminal matter, not ju- not 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 a civil matter, which if, would just if, be a if, fine. If it was enforced, obviously, but yeah, I, I, I definitely know. What you mean. Yeah, not to get too much on that other topic, but but even just like with nationalists. So Rayo here was saying that nationalists advocate coercion, which increases the power of a particular state. Well, if the limited government people are nationalists, and I'm saying before Trump, if pre-Trump the nationalists were, or excuse me, the limited government people were nationalists, that's kind of problematic, just right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in terms of people making decisions about whom they're going to associate and whatnot, that's something that, that I think the listeners should really kind of reflect on and decide for themselves whether they think Rayo was off-base or not. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So let's, uh, uh, and, and the limited government folks will come back into this here in just a moment, but, uh, uh, quote, most states make a determined effort to indoctrinate their subjects, and especially children, to support the present state policies, whatever these may be, through direct and indirect control of education, information, and entertainment media. So until very recently, almost all persons have been coercivists and differed with their rulers when they differed at all, only on petty details. This has been the case not only in communist Russia and China, but in America as well. The American government has been a pioneer in socialized education and mass propaganda, end quote. Uh, now, I, I want to mention this here, and just, not, just not, not to get too much into this, but, you know, back in 1967, that was probably a pretty radical thing to say, don't you think? Like, especially, I mean, the, the homeschooling movement, I guess you could say, wasn't really, you know, that popular until, you know, like the 1990s, I would say, you know, because uh, the, the Leaper case in Texas and where, like, it really gained traction. Yeah, uh, so, and not so only I, that. I think, I think Rayo's statement was a little, you know, probably pretty radical for, for, for his time, and, and obviously, you know, even for, you know, 15, 20 years after that. Yeah, and not, not only that, but as far as just as a side note about, about the homeschoolers, um, the pioneers of homeschoolers would be people like my mom during the 1980s with my siblings when the cops were banging down the door and they were base and 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 mom and my siblings were basically kind of huddled in the base. I haven't I haven't mentioned this ever publicly. Might as well do it now. They were huddled in the basement. They were religious people. I'm not, but they were religious people and they were praying. When the agents of the state, the bludgies, were basically trying to be more or less knock down the door. Uh, thankfully, nobody wow. went to jail that day. Yeah, I haven't talked about that publicly. Might as well mention it here since, you know, she's uh, six feet under. May she rest in peace. I'm just simply saying that you brought up about the time issue, the historical issue about Rayo saying that back then in the 60s. And it's like, yeah, and my mom was a, homeschool, a homeschooling pioneer in the 80s. So, yeah. yes, that kind of accentuates – Rayo being really far ahead of its time, even more so than my mom. So just saying, yeah, yes, yeah, you're definitely. right. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But let's uh, let's uh, let's get back. Well, I guess just to make one more comment on that. I mean, it just shows you, which I mean, both of us are already aware, and probably probably listeners are too. But how you know how how much you know the this, this state despises like homeschooling and alternative education because that's 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 where it all starts. That's where you know all, all the indoctrination and the uh, and the state worship begins. So yeah, it's, it's definitely crucial. Uh, uh, to their to, to to you know their their goals of creating citizens, uh, is what they do in public schools. But back to back to the article quote: the best known divergent bodies of opinion in America, the radical right and the radical left, are unfortunately not very radical. The right left polarization has reflected not so much a genuine desire for liberty, at least on the part of the leaders, as class special interests. While many persons on both the right and the left claim to want freedom, their advocacy is only partial and inconsistent. Thus, the radical left tends to oppose censorship and conscription, but endorses coercively financed welfare programs. Similarly, the radical right opposes Medicare and income taxes, but demands tougher laws against pornography. <laughs> Libertarian opinion, however, takes the best of both left and right and goes far beyond to a consistent advocacy of freedom, the total separation of state from all voluntary activities. Since only the libertarian is genuinely radical, only the libertarian truly seeks liberty, only the libertarian can provide a durable and effective opposition to the welfare warfare state, end quote. Uh, so I just want to, you know, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on this because he was pointing out the, the fact that, you know, the radical left and the radical uh, right aren't radical at all. Uh, I don't know. Do you think this kind of has any, you know, <laughs> any, any impact on what we're seeing today or like any, any, any bearing on it? The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think what Rayo is describing is, in some ways, not so much his own time period, although that's what he had knowledge of. I think, yet again, he's describing our time period now, today. Because the left-right paradigm does not change. The left-right paradigm is, as he described it, it is accurate with what I know. And so all those details he just mentioned is basically completely consistent. Indeed, and that's, that's, that kind of also shows you in some ways, not to get spiritual on anybody here, but it kind of shows you really how prophetic Rayo's observations were about the state back in the 1960s because of how accurately applicable it is even today in the, in the 2010s. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I think you're certainly correct. Uh, and then he also he kind of mentions you know liber- libertarianism and and this was b- back when in 1967 when he kind of you know was using the term libertarian. Uh, keep in mind that it does not mean what it meant or it did not mean what it means now. Uh, you know, I, I wrote an article of why I won't, won't call myself libertarian anymore. Uh, back back when he was using that term, it actually kind of you know meant something. It hadn't been bastardized and verbicided yet. Uh, but uh, but yeah, he's definitely right about you know liber- libertarianism and so far as you know. Uh, the only, the only, only the libertarian truly seeks liberty. The left and the right, uh, you know, just uh, they want their form of authoritarian control. Well, yeah, I mean that that is the left and the right. The left and the right are really the just the two wings on the same bird of prey that is the state, right? There's a, there's there's a really wonderful bumper sticker that says something to the effect of "It's not the left versus the right; it's you versus the state." And that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day what this is really about. This is basically about when you have the socialists and the fascists basically trying to vie for control of the ring of Mordor, such as the White House, uh, like they did this past electoral cycle, that's all that was happening. You know, freedom is never on the agenda of the political crusaders, as was mentioned in that episode that you and I have already done on that. Mm-hmm. It's the political crusaders really are authoritarians at the end of the day. Um, and you know, it's not just the collective movementism that, that kind of fuels that I would say it's also kind of underlying that is also the controlled schizophrenia. And of course the listeners should refer to those uh, relevant episodes for more details on those particular things. And so basically what, what Rayo is mentioning here about the left and the right, he's describing authoritarianism. He is literally describing totalitarianism that perhaps many of you listeners have learned about when you were in the public indoctrination camps, but the part that you were lied to, see, you were, you guys were told a half truth. The part that you were lied to about was basically the notion that, oh, the authoritarians and the totalitarians, that only happens to foreigners over there. It can't happen here on this particular portion of the North American continent from this latitude and longitude to that latitude and longitude because manifest destiny, because the city on the hill, because of all of this American exceptionalism, these myths (laughs) that were woven out of whole cloth by politicians who drew lines on a map and then called it borders, having nothing to do with the borders of your own home, but then they lie to everybody and say, well, see, here's our national borders. This is inexplicably equivalent to the, the, like the white picket fences many of you have uh, on, on, the border, on the actual real borders of your homes and your yards and such. I mean, that's how kooky it's gotten. I don't want to get too much into like, you know, private lands versus public lands, but I think a lot of people have been lied to about a lot of things. The left and the right don't exist. It's a fiction. They're authoritarians. Uh, and then, of course, the opposite of that, you know, sometimes they call themselves anti-authoritarians or libertarians or some other label. But that's more of an accurate dichotomy where you have people basically pushing uh, coercion and, and, and statism and such, and then you have the rest of us trying to basically do any form of pushback. That's something resembling more of a real dichotomy, where it really is you and me and Jim Bob down the street versus the state. Oh yeah, yeah, you're you're definitely yeah, you're definitely correct. But I want to get I want to move forward and get to because this this is where things get kind of interesting is where he kind of fleshes out the uh you know the the various uh, various types of libertarians. But quote. Libertarians can be subcategorized according to methods advocated for achieving and or preserving liberty. Libertarians include limited government advocates who seek a non-coercive central government financed by voluntary means and having as its principal functions national defense and appellate judiciary. Such a government is hypothetically achieved by ideological education culminating in legal transformation of the existing government. Autarky is hypothetically achieved as individuals discover ways to opt out. More and more persons see supporting and sanctioning the state, and it gradually atrophies. Most autarchists differ from competitive government advocates below in opposing retaliatory force and or in opposing the delegation of self-defense. And most autarchists differ from communitarians below in advocating market trade between individuals. Competitive government advocates who envision private police companies which competitively offer defense services to customers. Such protection agencies might hypothetically begin in relatively chaotic areas where no state is able to maintain order, gradually growing, and expanding their services to residents of states offering protection against the state. Communitarians, who seek voluntary collectivism in small, usually agrarian communities or cooperatives, trade or barter being predominantly between communities. Many communitarians base their ideas on fundamental religious beliefs, 
Examples of existing and economically quite successful voluntary communist communities are the Huderite Bruderovs. Existing communes exploit legal interstices within the state. Most communitarians, like autarchists, believe the state will wither away as more and more persons opt out by forming cooperatives. Decentralists, who advocate partitionment of large states into many smaller states, culminating in a world of thousands of independent city-states. The decentralists would have relatively little concern regarding the form of government of any particular mini-state, counting on direct and indirect competition to keep most of them rather free most of the time, and on personal mobility to assure his, his freedom, iron curtains being impossible for many states. Many decentralists expect a catastrophic economic collapse to so severely weaken the central governments of large states, such as America and Russia, to permit regions and political subdivisions to establish autonomy. Anarchists, who advocate destruction of coercive states through retaliatory force against the rulers. In the hypothetical anarchic society which follows, criminals are discouraged and the growth of new states is discouraged by intensive personal cultivation of self-defense. Not all historical anarchists have been libertarians. A libertarian anarchist might advocate rioting, but only against the state and state-held property. He would not intentionally seize or destroy non-coercively acquired property. Most other libertarians oppose rioting for ta tactical reasons. The Watts riots were not anarchy. Both the rioters and the police were coercivists. End quote. So uh, I think we've got a lot to talk about here, Kyle. So I, I think we'll just kind of go, you know, bullet point by bullet point or subcategory by subcategory and just kind of, you know, uh, uh, talk about this. So uh, uh, as limited government advocates... Uh, uh, seek a non-coercive central government financed by voluntary means. You think that's accurate? No, of course not. What <laughs> he's trying to describe, and, and by the way, folks, this is going to be one of those few times we're going to you know, disagree with Rayo to greater or lesser extents, but it's with the understanding that he was writing this like in the 60s and 70s or, or, or thereabouts. So, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm going to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, uh, you know, quite a bit considering, of course, all of his uh, positive contributions and such. But yeah, regarding this, uh, no, his description was wrong here. I think what he was trying to describe were the objectivists who, to be uh -huh. perfectly fair, did openly say at many times before they compromised their principles and became neoconservatives. They were very much, and, and even, uh, you know, the goddess of the market, you know, Miss Rand herself, said that, yeah, well, the taxation isn't really taxation like how libertarians usually conceive of it. It's really just more like a membership fee type thing because it's voluntary. Therefore, taxation is not exactly that because it's not really taxation at that point, which was kind and of how the objectivists mind, viewed and, and, and it. Keep, and keep in mind also that uh, uh, in that article we read by Benjamin Best, I think it was number, in, in TVP number one, uh, he was at the Nathaniel Brain Institute. He associated with quite a few objectivists early on. So uh, it's a, it's it's not surprising that you know that's kind of his how he saw limited government. Right now, to refer back to the rival gangs of looters list, because I think this is relevant to the limited government advocates and really why they are not libertarians, even if you use a really broad definition of libertarian, is because. Well, the constitutionalists, I think, are really where the Maginot line is. So let, let's try and figure this out, okay? So the constitutionalists are states' rights advocates, generally speaking. I don't think anybody's going to contest that. They are states' rights advocates. So there is your first problem. Your second problem is that the constitutionalists are nationalists. I don't think anybody's going to uh -huh. contest that either. So now they're, that's two of the rival gangs of looters. Uh, now, some people have been arguing the racist thing is kind of – I don't know. There's the alt-right, I think, would, would probably be like the dividing line. So maybe they – so to be fair, maybe they weren't before, but like there definitely are now if they support Trump and all of that, which isn't even so much about race. It's more about supporting mercantilism. Um, so, I mean, there, there's kind of that. And then, of course, if you – again, to go back to Hop. If Hobb is indeed correct that democracy or really limited government was what he was really criticizing, you know, if limited government taken to its logical ex logical extent is not as was mentioned, which will which we'll get to in, in more detail, is not some sort of decentralist thing like Rayo was describing here in this article, but it's more it's really globalism. If the lot like the logical end of democracy is globalism, then that would mean the constitutionalists, the limited government advocates, would actually be in favor of of like a one world government, uh, logically speaking, even though they explicitly deny it. And so this is why I don't like nationalism in particular, is because nationalism is globalism. 
there's this false dichotomy that's been made in within the alternative media by various people who I will not name here because I don't want to give free advertising. But essentially, they make this dichotomy that, well, if you're outside the left-right paradigm, then you should be a nationalist and stand with us American patriots to defend America from the globalists. And, oh. yeah, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> well, that's the line that we've been fed, and at one point, I gave it a little too much credence, even though I was kind of reluctant. And now that I have a better understanding of economics, and I'm less economically illiterate than I was even two years ago— because I read books and stuff, and as well as talk to you know certain economists whenever I can get a chance, that yeah, I mean, yeah, nationalism leads you to globalism. So you know, unless one of the constitutionalists really wants to rebut that, you know, I don't know, man. I, I think I think Rayo was trying to be kind here to the limited government advocates. But in the decades since, even even before Trump, in the decades since, how can you be a nationalist? How can you be a states' rights advocate? But then also, but, and but then like limited government is still this nice, soft, cuddly thing. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. And that's before we even get into the socialism of like specific types of things, like the constitutionalists advocating for public roads, but then screaming about how the cops shouldn't be pulling them over, or screaming about public lands. But then also equally screaming about how the federal government should transfer ownership of this piece of land to that other government. I mean, it's the, it's controlled schizophrenia. So people and, should and, really and, and then also you know Benjamin Benjamin Tucker's four monopolies, which are inherent in the Constitution. Which uh, you know that's that's a uh, I wrote uh, about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's 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 a, that's another another negative aspect. But uh, but I, I think our audience uh, uh, here at TVP is uh, is uh, is quite astute when it comes to the the problems with limited government. So let's go ahead and uh, and move forward here. So Autarchus, uh, who desire to be left alone by the government, but otherwise do not especially care about it. So I don't know. I mean, I mean it, and we'll get to this later on, but, uh, but yeah, Rhea was not an anarchist by his own definition of anarchism. So uh, as we kind of mentioned in uh, 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 Anarchic Vani, that, you know, Vani isn't anarchic, but it kind of overlaps in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not anarchic because Rayo <laughs> Rayo was not uh, was on anarchist, but I I don't know for, from his definition of, of of autarky, I think that would be kind of what Rayo is because he he he's he's fine with coexist. He was he was fine coexisting with the state. He didn't want to take it over or you know uh, uh or destroy it. He you know just he just wanted to you know just go live out live out in his polyethylene tent and you know let let the let and just just live free. What do you I think? think I think that's accurate. Although I think this is I think the autarchist thing, so called, is really a reference to Robert Lefebvre, I think. And I don't particularly care for that position, mainly because one, I'm not a pacifist. Pacifism was actually, unless someone wants to correct me on this, pacifism was actually very important to the autarchist. So they're kind of following like the Quaker uh, tradition as far as that goes, and uh, the other and and and, and Rayo would differ from that too. So yeah. So so maybe he's not an autarchist to be perfectly fair, although he's close to that. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's important to the autarchist is is that yeah, I guess you could say they were. It would be accurate to say they did want to be like left alone by the government. But then again, how many of Robert Lefebvre's people went on to basically betray their principles and go become political crusaders again? So, you know, either you have the courage of your convictions or you don't. Um, you know, I, I don't know, dude. You know, I, I've read some of the autarchist literature over the years, and this is actually the first time I'm talking publicly about it or, or whatever. And I am it's not— a, it's, a, it's a night of first. <laughs> it is a night of first, yes. I am not a big fan of autarchism, so-called. I am not a big fan of Robert Lefebvre. I think he was basically—I'm going to be perfectly—I think he was a dumbass. I really disrespect, honestly. I disrespect Robert Lefebvre. I do. I know, and look, I know a lot of the older libertarians of various flavors really like the guy, and maybe he had his contributions. I think Robert Lefebvre is worthless, to be quite frank. Hell, I would be kinder towards Tom Woods in his state nullification crud than I would be to Robert Lefebvre if I were to, you know, if I were to pick the lesser of two evils over here. So, no, I mean, like, yes, Rayo is correct for pointing it out, but are they worth anything? To me, no. 
but the audience is smart enough to to try and you know kind of figure this out at least in some sense. I just figure they might as well hear my version of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And honestly, I've I'm not I wasn't familiar. I'm I'm not I'm still not really familiar with uh, autarchism. Thanks for you know enlightening me on that uh, as well as I'm sure some some of the listeners too. So yeah, I have nothing to add there. I, I think you you raised some. some I don't know, man. Maybe sense. maybe the national anarchism thing, which I know you covered on 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 the LUA series. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's better than autarchism, or maybe they're kind of similar, where it's kind of like it's an interesting thought experiment, but they're both kind of garbage for different reasons. I mean, I don't know. I'm getting a little uh, speculative there, but in terms of compare and contrasting, but yeah, what I do know about autarchism, it's it's very limp wristed. It's very weak need. It's it's not. We're, they, they don't, they're not solving problems. They're don't, I don't even think they even get into lifestyle change issues like how like how Rayo does. It's just it's just a lot of pacifism and laying about. I don't know. I've got more respect for potheads, to be quite frankly. I mean, I don't want to rip on them too hard here, but it's just like I don't like Robert Lefebvre. I'm sorry, I just don't. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Let's uh, let's move forward to to this next one here. So, competitive government adv. I'm going to read this entire thing because we got to discuss this. Quote, competitive government advocates who envision private police companies which competitively offer defense services to customers. Such protection agencies might hypothetically begin in relatively chaotic areas where no state is able to maintain order, gradually growing and expanding their services to residents of states offering protection against the state. And I'm also going to, we're going to go ahead and cover the anarchist thing here too because these are so closely related. I think we need to, we need to do these at once. Uh, and then moving down three bullet to the third bullet to the I guess moving down two bullet points to the third one, uh, quote anarchists who advocate destruction of coercive states through retaliatory force against the rulers. Uh, so obviously he mentions you know the libertarian anarchists might advocate rioting but only against the state and state held property. Uh, he wouldn't you know violate property rights. Um, most other libertarians oppose rioting for tactical reasons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again. Rayo was not an anarchist. Uh, he had, uh, I, I think, a, a flawed outlook on anarchism. But uh, uh, you know, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, let that slide here simply because, I mean, I, it seems like he kind of has the same. He, he kind of had the same understanding of anarchism that Ayn Rand and Ludwig von Mises did. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, at, at that, like, they they had more of an excuse because, like, when they were when they were like, you know, writing and talking about it back in, you know, like the the, the earlier nineteen hundreds. That they had a little more excuse, so so Rayo isn't going to come out clean on this one, but because there was, you know, like Rothbard was around, I'm pretty sure, uh, publishing like writing articles and stuff, and mm -hmm. I mean there there were there was, there was some you know some proprietarian anarchists around, maybe not even not maybe not as many as there are today, but there was there was still some work around, and he was in a lot of those libertarian publications. Uh, I mean, Conkin mentioned him for for Christ's sake. So, I mean, I, so there, little little obviously little leeway there, but but again. Uh, maybe maybe just wasn't maybe just wasn't interested in it. Maybe he did, uh, he obviously didn't under, didn't understand it. But uh, I, I think his description of competitive government advocates, you know, private police companies which competitively offer defense services to customers. I think, well, what he's describing there is inter integral capitalism. You know, private defense organizations, uh, or uh, pri private defense associations. I think that's uh, he he's 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 just, I think he's kind of mixing these two up because the competitive government yeah, advocates that'd be a po polyarchy, right? That'd be kind of what you used to be. That's correct, and yes, I. Uh, for those who may not have listened to uh, the, you know the LUA series or whatever, uh, the direct action series in particular, yes, I, I used to be a polyarchist. I used to believe that you could have a free market in governance, and then I sat down one day and kind of really thought about it and realized I was being a dummy. And you know, hey, you know, I have to grow up and learn sometime, right? And so that's what I was before I you know decided to become a Vonoist, which is what I am today. Um, yeah, I mean, the main problem is, and, and this is really what the Virginia School of Economics really shows, that, that for people who aren't familiar, that's, that's like the public choice theory, if you will. What's valuable about the Virginia School, the public choice theory, is that their whole orientation, as far as I understand it, is that if you apply free market principles to the government, you basically end up with the tyranny we're facing today. Right. So if the Austrian school basically tells you, here's how the free market functions, just as it is, like, you know, naturally, organically and such, the Virginia school economists will tell you, well, if you basically take those free market principles that presumably you learn from the Austrians and you try to run government the same way, it basically will be the despotism that mm -hmm. we're suffering through right now. So in essence, the Virginia school of economics, whether they intended to or not, and I don't think they did, because some of them were, a lot of them are minarchists, actually. Um, the the <laughs> essentially the Virginia School of Economics public choice theory debunks polyarchy 
and debunks uh, the whole mm. competitive government thing. So that's kind of rather important. Therefore, when you start looking at, not to go too broadly on this, but when you start looking at things like sovereign free ports, which Rayo is at least hopeful of, you know, it's kind of getting into a little bit of an odd area there, isn't it? It's like, well, it's one thing if it's going to be kind of like an independent autonomous zone, like a permanent autonomous zone, right? Like a PAS, but like, what if it becomes a government? You know, and where exactly are those dividing lines? Yeah. But I think, but I yeah. think, but to be perfectly fair, I think Rayo here was not talking about sovereign free ports or, or permanent autonomous zones. When he's describing mm -hmm. competitive government advocates and what they want, I think what he was describing were basically uh, microstates. So um, I think that certain examples, just to make this concrete for the listeners, I think would include things like Liechtenstein. Um, what was the name of the country that they tried starting in Eastern Europe a few years ago and it didn't go oh, quite well? Yeah. Uh, Liber no, Liberland. Liber Wasn't it Liberland? Liberland. Liberland. Yes, that's it. That's okay, it. there was Liberland. Yeah, Liberland was not a sovereign free port. It's not a permanent autonomous zone. At best, it was supposed to be a microstate. And they even wrote up a constitution. And see, that's the other thing, too. Like, if you have, like, a sovereign free port, I don't think there would necessarily be, like, monopoly laws. And maybe that's kind of a distinction between, like, a PAS, a permanent autonomous zone, and a microstate. Or, let's say, a, a government, a, a competitive government that, of course, the polyarchists would like. So I think there is a difference here between a very, very small, like, geographically small monopoly with laws and constitutions and statutes and, and courts and such, uh, monopoly courts, versus just an independent autonomous area. You know, for example, consider, uh, for a more fictional example, consider, uh, for those of you who like science fiction, like L. Neal Smith's The Probability Brooch. The North American Confederacy was essentially one big, huge, permanent autonomous zone, pretty much of the North American continent. Okay, there really was no government. The closest thing they had a government was an occasional ad hoc Congress that they put together. Uh, occasionally in like Denver was technically the capital of the Confederacy. But it wasn't really like a Confederacy, like an actual government, because there were no laws. And all of the mm -hmm. voting for the ad hoc Congress, not to go too deeply in this, but just to kind of, kind of debunk polyarchy a little bit more, using this fictional example in this novel, the ad hoc Congress in that novel, all the voting was done, at, the constituencies and all that was done at large. So it so the constituencies weren't even you know geographically dependent. So uh, the, so yeah, the, peop the 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 people who were that of that fictional North American Confederacy, like technically they had a government, but it was really this ad hoc Congress that met in a dilapidated barn that had to be reinforced with basically something like plexiglass. But like if you go out into the rest of the Confederacy, everything is really high tech and shiny and and you know modern for their standard of living and so forth. So the competitive government advocates, the polyarchists, I think mean well. And if anybody was being really honest, Shane, I honestly do think, and going through my own ideological changes over the past few years and such. Honestly, I think polyarchy is last ditch minarchism. It's a, it's not yeah it, it's not uh, you know it's not completely it's not completely you know giving up the idea of government but it's like okay fine like it's going you know. most of the way I would I would yeah. say it's going if we're, if it's if we're gonna you know if it's this is gonna be shades of gray I think polyarchy goes most of the way because it gets it gets really really close but it doesn't quite. I don't want to say fall off the edge, but it doesn't quite go as as far as it needs to. But it gets close, and, and it really also gets people really thinking about the consent of the governed. You know, is that a contradictory concept? You know, either way, depending how you answer that question. And then, of course, if you do answer the question as yes, there is such a thing as consent of the governed, then what's what's the threshold of consent? And yeah. especially once you start applying it, even in the like analogously in terms of like criminal activity. Like, oh, you know, did somebody consent to taxation because they handed over their wallet while they had a gun to their head? You know, I mean, then so then the threshold of consent also becomes very important because even the polyarchist would recognize that everything's based on that. And then, of course, if there if the consent is not given, then freedom of movement between the different, you know, governments or, or the micro states, if you will, becomes very, very, very important. Because then otherwise, if you're trapped in some place, then yeah, there there isn't even a pro pretense at a social contract because you're not acquiescing. And that would be also be consistent with classical liberalism as well. Because remember, they rely on tacit consent or acquiescence, as John Locke called it, to even to have the government even be legitimate. 
But of course, that raises another question. You know, if you are a dissident, if you are explicitly disagreeing with the legitimacy of what calls itself the state or the government or whatever, and you're saying, hey, I'm, I don't consent to any of this, then th th is, is that sufficient for demonstrating that you have refused consent? Or for those people who did give consent before, but now they've changed their minds because the government's become despotic more notably than it was before, you know, revoking consent or rescinding consent too, because the government mm -hmm. broached the contract, the contract being usually some form of constitutional law. I don't want to get too deeply into this, but the polyarchists mean well, and I used to be one of them. But yeah, the problem is you cannot run government like it's a business. You can't run government like... Uh, it's it's has anything of common. Uh, you know, the state is not the market, and I think that is the critical mistake that polyarchists make is that they assume that you can somehow magically turn the state into the market or similar to the market if you just geographically make it small enough. It doesn't work in the real world. Yeah, yeah, I think you I think you covered that one quite sufficiently. I but yeah, so so that was so so yeah, you you discussed com competitive government advocates. But yeah, I just want to reiterate the reiterate the, the the fact that what he's describing with private police companies is actually anarcho capitalism. But again, that just leads back to his his his, his not his, his not understanding of capital or his not understanding of capitalism. Yeah, and anarchists. Anarchism. Yeah, and anarchists. You know, whether you love them or hate them, folks, not all of them are, shall I say, revolutionaries. Which I think is what Rayo was trying to describe yeah, them as. Yeah, that that's 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 a problem. So like, he, obviously, we we've talked a lot about the various anarchic schools of thought, and some of them are worlds apart. As far as you know, what what they put in their manifestos and what they what they advocate for and, and all of that. Uh, so yeah, he kind of clumps all anarchists into like it, it seems like it's kind of two two different realms. So you have the it's more of the syndicalist variety, which obviously doesn't use by name, and then you have the uh, the libertarian anarchist, so to speak. So this this would be more like pretty much anything, but I mean like let's just say like but the the agorist anarch capitalists. Um, maybe the mutual, maybe the mutuals, whatever. We'll just toss them in here just for just for just for the sake of, of this discussion. And then you know maybe uh, and then black flag, like he, like it. I think he's kind of describing like those folks here, like uh, uh, or he's kind of identifying those folks. But he's still not right about that because there's a world of difference between a lot of these inter anarchic schools of thought. So, uh, so that's definitely uh, <laughs> an issue there. He kind of just tosses them into tosses them into two camps, whether they they want to destroy the state by rioting and destroying private property or those who may riot but only destroy state-held property uh, and or, you know, oppose rioting for tactical reasons. So I think he's, he's, he's definitely off base there. There's no way around it. Uh, there's literally no way around it. Hey, you know, you and I have never said Rayo was perfect. We just we just really like the guy because he was he was had a lot of unique observations, you know, historically for his time. And, and, and I would also say even universally, too, uh, at least with certain things. But, yeah, on this one. I think he really did not understand what the hell he was talking about, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you kind of mentioned the, the fact that like we 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 actually disagree with him on this one, but yeah, Ray was, Ray was definitely a very intelligent man. He offered he offered a lot uh, to 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 the you know the the outlook of freedom uh, and strategies to, to to you know reach that, but. We're still in season one. Season one and season two will be analyzing Rayo's work. So we're going to talk a lot about Rayo in season one and season two. There's just no way around it. Uh, it for for example, uh, like you can't talk about uh, like you can't talk about the car without talking about uh, about Henry Ford. Like you just get to, like you you have to kind of start there, right, Kyle? Like you can't you can't just jump forward and say, okay, uh, now we have electric cars. And it's like, well, hold on, we're, let's back up a second. Where, where the hell did this come from? Uh, you, you can't you can't just like jump straight in past like you know the founders' ideas, so to speak. Yeah, and 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 just to remind everybody, that's why we're kind of going through this. I guess you could call it more philosophical material because we're trying to kind of you know kind of well bring back Vanu because it's been several decades at least. You know, Rayo disappeared in 1974, as was mentioned in the in the in in, in the probably inaugural 40, probably 47 years. We'll just say you know 1970 like 1970s on. You're probably about 40 years. Yeah, exactly. So we're kind of having to start, you know, go from go from the ground floor, much like how the Agoras have done with their uh, uh, strategy uh, over the past several years, where they had to start like f like from the ground floor and kind of introduce Sam Conk and then kind of, you know, kind of explain, uh, you know, certain things and then eventually working their way up to Agoras class theory and, and so forth. You know, we're kind of doing the same thing here.
You know, that's why yeah, we're that covering was, the that circle. Was a, that, was a, that was a better com- the comparison. Yeah, I don't know why I went to the cars with Henry Ford, but yeah, that's a better. <laughs> Gorsuch was better. Yes, yeah, you, got, you start you start with Conkin. So yeah, that that's kind of yeah that that's kind of where we're going with this. So, uh, and I think the next one here, Kyle, is communitarians. I mean, other than just to say that you know communism doesn't work, it does it can't solve the economic calculation problem. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it's bad all around. I don't really think there's a whole lot else to say on this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, man. The communitarians. I I think Rayo was trying to describe at least some. I would say actually probably most accurately would probably be the syndicalists actually because remember the syndicalists have always said they wanted their radical trade unions and like living which I guess they would probably also be living on top of each other you know kind of like in an almost like militant type situation I think I think you and I actually mentioned this on a previous episode before too uh, where it would be very much they'd be around each other 24-7 and so forth because it was supposed to be very very tight knit and and closed in in that sense because they would be running the factory worker self-management as the uh, syndicalists like to tell us over and over again who also usually tend to be European which which is interesting but yeah I I think the communitarians are really just the syndicalists as because that's voluntary collectivism Mm -hmm. too yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And he does mention uh, the fact that uh, most communitarians, like autarchists, believe the state will wither away. So yeah, he's talking about the syndical. He's not talking about you know communists. Like, well, they, he's not saying like if, if they just like, kind of opt out for now and then wait until they can revolt, uh, then they can take over the state. Yeah, I think he's describing syndicalists here. But uh, okay, the next one, decentralists, which you've already we've already kind of covered, you know, without kind of using the name. Well, actually, no, we, we you have kind of used the name. Uh, but the, but the decentralists quote who advocate partitionment of large states into many smaller states, culminating in a world of thousands of independent city-states. So, I don't know. We might have hammered that one home already, but do you have any additional thoughts there? I would just say this. This is kind of problematic, at least with the typology he tried to put here, because with the decentralists, you could say that, yeah, they are polyarchists, the competitive government advocates, as Rayo called it, but let me be a little bit worse here. Why wouldn't the states' rights advocates not be decentralists? Two. So as you can see, I I, I almost kind of got the feeling that this. Uh, I hate to say this about Rayo, but I, I'm not going to ignore it. I almost get the feeling like this article was was like still in its draft form, and he needed a proofreader at least, or at least somebody who kind of understood where he was coming from. And that like you that know. that or I mean maybe maybe I mean uh, he, he talked about you know making money from you know uh, uh, Vonnie Life and stuff. Maybe he was like reaching a deadline, and he had to you know just put something out there. I mean, I, I don't know. There are a lot of possibilities, but yeah, this is one of, especially with his descriptions on on some of these subcategories. I, I think he, uh, yeah, there's there's some explanation there. It's, and it's, the not, cross- it's not it's not as good as as a lot of his work. I see where he was going with it in terms of its of the thesis, but the examples he's he's trying to illustrate here. Unfortunately, the list of who counts as the different types of libertarians and then who counts as the different types of coercivists, they start blending all together, and and that's not yeah, even... and and the, and, the, and the fact that he like so libertarians can be subcategorized. So these are the these are the subcategories of of, of anarchism. So or, or libertarian libertarianism rather, limited government advocates, which we've already talked about, uh, not, not libertarians. Autarchists, you've raised your concerns with them, probably not libertarians as as far as classified by you. Competitive government advocates, uh, well. Uh, yeah, again, we talked about that. The syndicalists, the, as he calls them, the communitarians, are libertarians. Uh, decentralists, yeah, again, we've, we've talked about that. And then his complete miscategorization and, and classification of, of anarchists and kind of tossing them all into the same little, the same little uh, boiling pot. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't... <sighs> I don't know. This is especially, you know, when he was discussing the, uh, uh, the the rival gangs of looters. I think he was, you know, he was fine on that one, right? But uh, when he starts, like, you know, breaking up uh, libertarians into subcategories, I think it's 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 not good. That's not good. No, no. And you know what? Actually, now that we're kind of doing this, it's kind of giving me an idea. You know, maybe at some point I should, I don't know, maybe rewrite this for him in a sense. Maybe, maybe like libertarians and coercivists redux, maybe perhaps. Just, yes. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it'd be wise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because we're kind of going through this with a fine tooth comb. And again, I'm not taking anything away from Rayo. I can't stress that enough. But at the same time, like, I don't view him as a guru or anything like that. The man was fallible, much like how I'm fallible, and, and many of you are fallible and such, and, and that's I'm okay. Not. I'm not, though. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know everything, right? I'm, I'm a perfect little snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I see the thesis. I see where he was going. I do see the value in it, but the examples are just... 
a little bit right and correct here and there. I think probably the most accurate he got was right at the beginning. Actually, ooh, no, I can't say that even about the felons, even. Because remember, he said statists and felons. I think he was right about statists. But then when he described felons, it's like, well, yeah, but I don't know about the 60s, but I definitely know in my time period, you know, there are perfectly innocent people who are convicted felons that have never, you know, personally uh -huh. coerced anybody. Yeah, yeah, political prisoners much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, you, you see, you see the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, honestly, guys, like we 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 were, we we didn't prepare for this one much. It was pre pretty much going to be read the article and whatever comes up comes up, and uh, didn't actually plan for it to be. You know, like like this is going to be the one where we disagreed. But I, I think when we talked about it, it was really only the anarchist one. But now that we're kind of doing this, I mean, yeah, it's a little, a little more harsh than even we thought it would be. But, but yeah, when, when we're kind of talking about this, yeah, it's uh, there, there are definitely some issues with this. But again, I think there's some 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 very good points, especially outside of the, the categorizations, uh, of course, and things that were pretty astute for for his time. Yeah, I I, be I yeah I believe so. So maybe maybe I should maybe put that on my list of things to write. Perhaps maybe maybe a bridge maybe between season one and season two is is kind of doing a redux on libertarians and coercivists. And oh, uh, so yeah, so, so yeah, so so chalk chalk another episode up on the uh, on the schedule to delay us from getting <laughs> season two even more. I'm sorry, guys. I'm really sorry. Wait, it like, could be, it could also be a special episode or something. I don't know. We can just we can discuss that privately perhaps. Uh, but yeah. yeah, the point the point though is that. I mean, guys, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm a Vonoist. I mean, like, this is my thing, but I'm sorry. I think this is one thing that Rayo got kind of wrong. And I, I, that's why I said I got, I got, I'm getting the kind of feeling that, yes, I'm talking about my feelings, right? I'm, I'm getting the feeling. How, how, I, do, you, how do you feel, Kyle? How, how do, do feel? I feel? <laughs> Actually, I feel fine, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking that. Perhaps what you were kind of speculating a moment ago is is probably accurate. Maybe he was trying to rush and meet a deadline. Maybe he didn't proofread it or had someone help him proofread or whatever as closely as they should have. And then realizing like, hey, man, maybe if you kind of were to move some things around, this could actually make a lot more sense. You know, again, I see where he was going, but I, I think he kind of screwed up, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And, and the I, I examples so. are, are, are particularly bad or inaccurate. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who are going to call Vanu, uh, Vanu a cult. Uh, yeah, you're listening to the people who 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 started the Vonnie podcast and spend you know a couple hours, a couple of few hours a week you know doing this show, and uh, uh and, and yeah, there's a lot of disagreements, especially at least with this one. Uh, this isn't yeah, uh, so I think that kind of you know, <laughs> 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 I think I think that kind of solves that issue right now. So we, we've kind of headed that off before it before it even comes yep. up. So uh, so good good deal, good deal. So let's like go ahead and move forward here, and and then we'll we'll, we'll have plenty to talk about from from these last few paragraphs, and hell, I might even stop again. We'll see. Quote, many libertarians favor multiple approaches to liberation. Since a durable, completely free society has not existed on Earth, there is no proof that any of the hypothesized libertarian societies can be established and endure. However, the existing states, especially the larger nations, are so utterly immoral and rampantly destructive that fear of unforeseen consequences could hardly deter one from seeking freedom. States have been by far the biggest thieves and most brutal murderers throughout history. Beside the murder of millions of Jews by the Nazi state, the murder of millions of Kulaks by the Russian state, and the murder of millions of innocent residents of Dresden, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, without even the excuse of military expediency by the American state, the most depraved of private felons pale in significance. Most of the economic technological progress has been the result of free enterprise. Notable private inventions include the steam engine, the cotton gin, the electric generator, telephone, internal combustion engine, airplane radio, and antibiotics. The history of states is a chronicle of death and destruction. Their most notable inventions have been the cross, the rack, the guillotine, the gas chamber, and the atomic bomb. Every major coercive state has used the threat of foreign states. And actually, let me back up here. This, I think, is the most, the, the most profound and the most relevant. Uh, people, people still don't understand this. They really don't. They really don't. Even when I was a, uh, a constitutionalist and a conspiracist, I mean, I was even aware of this at like age 19. It's really not that, really not that complicated. I don't see how, how, how it is that complicated. But, quote, every major coercive state has used the threat of foreign states to distract the attention of subjects from its own violence. That is a status con game as old as recorded history. Thus, the American rulers try to justify domestic totalitarianism as a defense against communist totalitarianism, even as they aid communist governments in the enslavement of their own people, and even as the communist states, in turn, exhort their subjects with fear of American imperialism. But when, as in the present case, 
States are merely quarreling over who shall rule the slaves. It is seldom worthwhile to aid or abet either side. Rather, one should regard both as mortal enemies and develop means of personal defense, end quote. So, Kyle, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, so some parts there in the middle was, as we kind of discussed, are very bad uh, and wrong in a, in a lot of ways. But uh, I think he ends out this article with a bang. Yes. I really do. Yes, he <laughs> does. And in that last paragraph particularly, he's describing controlled opposition. And at least in some sense, I think he's also probably describing the Hegelian dialectic, right? Problem, reaction, solution, as, as a certain British uh, man would put it. So, yeah, I mean, no, notice that, too. So if you look at, like, our current time period, especially in the uh, – now, now, let's say in the period of Trump, uh, you know, political uh, – people who, you know, politically crusaded for him and all that – uh, you know, that's kind of interesting, right? We have to defend ourselves against the – who's the enemy image now? Is it the Muslims now? Well, it's, it's those seven is Muslim states that he currently signed an executive order against. Oh, uh, the travel know, ban, was, yeah. It, was, it wasn't the – it was the Russians. No, it isn't the Russians. Now it's, you know, Muslims again. And I, I, have, no, I have no idea who's, who the enemy is this week. I have no, I have no <laughs> damn idea. Yeah, they keep changing oh, it, right? Oh, yeah, because Oceania is at war with East Asia. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia except, of course, what happened with the the other month was that Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia. You see, the second part of that from 1984 <laughs> is the clue where it's set, where they say about it, you, Oceania has always been at war with whomever they're claiming. And see, the second sentence is actually a clue that something has changed. And unfortunately, um, with a lot of uh, people basically really not being cognizant of their own history, in some ways, we don't even have that second sentence anymore. Unfortunately, because people have been so Orwellianized. Is that a word? Maybe that's it should a good, be. That's a, that's a good word. Yeah. yeah okay. Like maybe, maybe that should be coined here on this episode, right? They've been so Orwellianized that it's see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They have the conscious, not to get spiritual too much, but they basically have the consciousness of an amoeba, like the, the, like the, per, like the persistent notion of now. I mean, even, even more so than like a chicken with its head cut off. Not to mix metaphors, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, if you think about it, there's no like, there's no sense of the past, there's no sense of the future. There is just the now, and not in like some sort of like spiritually uplifting notion of like meditation or something, but more in the sense of, you know, I don't even want to say no, you're, no, you're 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 exact. Sorry, cut, sorry to to butt in here, but you're exactly right. This is something that even when I was a conspiracist, you know, it was the 19 year old dumbass that uh, later became a sovereign citizen for a period of time, uh, but. Anyway, like that was something that I even noticed. Uh, it, <laughs> oh man, yeah, it, it it definitely was, it definitely was. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, other people really, really, really didn't see that. I mean, I I watched, uh, you know, uh, this was you know like when when ISIS apparently got big and they were ISIS and they were I I S and then they were uh whatever else they called them ISIL like, there was oh, ISIL and the, yeah and there's ISIL and so there's there are all those names then then there's obviously uh there's obviously the the short term memory and and this is why you know what um. When they like when when the media reports on something like there's something so atrocious they have to report on it. What they like and this is something I've noticed. What, what they do is they they kind of release things like, you know, like once a week they kind of release something new, and then people just don't connect the dots like all of those together. Uh, people forget what they heard last week. Uh, I mean it's it's just yeah it's it, it's short term memory. It's all yeah it's all about now. You're you're exactly right. Uh, if if it wasn't you know uh, I mean help most people can't even remember what they ate for breakfast for Christ's sake. So uh, I mean. <laughs> it's all yeah it is all about right now it is well and the kind of worst part too is that in private conversation i don't want to get too much onto this other topic but but try to relate it back to uh the, that last paragraph in in rayo's article here that we're talking about this episode on you know even some people that i'm probably not going to be associating with much for for much longer because they know i don't like trump because of of course the political crusading episode that just came out right um it's very interesting that even people who have were in favor of limited government now have joined the alt right and saying how wonderful Trump, our dear leader, is and such. You know, it's very interesting because many of them were Tea Partiers back in 09 and 2010 when it was popular to be against Barack H. Obama, as they like to call him a lot because they like to stress the H part, which of course stands for Hussein, because they wanted to stress that he may. Or may not, but who knows? Where's the birth certificate, right? 
uh, that uh, he was uh, maybe a foreigner because he's Barack Hussein Obama, Barack H. Obama. He is not my president, many of the Tea Partiers said. And when I told some of those people relatively recently that he, meaning Trump, he is not my president, oh my goodness, did the fireworks go off. So my, haven't we changed our tune quite a little bit? And that kind of is is kind of not good because, you know, it's not like they didn't know. It's not like they haven't been exposed to, well, people like me, for instance, where kind of explaining about how controlled opposition works or the Hegelian dialectic or many of these other different control mechanisms. Hell, I had even occasionally talk about false flags every once in a while when I thought it was relevant. Uh, but apparently all of that, dare shall I say, education via private conversations over the past couple of years apparently was, well, a lot of it was in vain. Not totally in vain, but with some of them, it's apparently been in vain because Trump can do no wrong. The king can do no wrong because he's going to protect us from Muslims. Or wait, is it Arabic people? Insert boogeyman here. Yeah, and if it, yeah, and if it, well, I mean, they can't, and see, that's the other problem too, is that a lot of people can't even differentiate between Muslims which is a worldwide religion with many adherents who are actually Africans, not Middle Eastern, between Muslims and then people who are just more broadly, you know, Arabic or Middle Eastern or basically that part, that, that region of the world. I mean, that, I mean, that's kind of the level of duh, literal. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, you talk about a typical it's, it's, American. It's, 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 exactly, it's exactly like, uh, you know, what? Uh, um... You have, uh, I guess, maybe the Black Lives Matter or maybe like the self-hating white people saying like, well, uh, all whites are bad or, you know, like uh, uh, whatever, whatever it is. And, th and they don't realize that there are a lot of different types of whites like there are Europeans. There are you know, like th there are a lot of different types of white people. Uh, it's not just, you know, like uh, th there's not just like one solid, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, culture, or cultural or ethnic background. Uh, just because their skin color is the same, right? But so that doesn't it's, matter. It's kind, of miss, it's kind of missing the point, right? And it doesn't matter to the neocons and the other political crusaders. People should really go listen to that episode. They haven't yet already. Doesn't matter the other political crusaders. Uh, you know what the enemy image of the week is, because just like it, you know, just what the people who have been Orwellianized. I'm going to use that term more often now. But the, the people who have been Orwellianized, they have their two minutes hate. Remember that, too? The two minutes hate. Oh, look, there's Emmanuel Goldstein. Let's yell at the, te the telescreens because Emmanuel Goldstein's there. Hell, yeah. I remember when the equivalent of Emmanuel Goldstein was Osama bin Laden. But now that he's officially uh -huh. dead, according to the official story, let's not get into that separate topic. But the point is that now there's the new two minutes hate with the new enemy image because it will never die. It'll always be something with the state. With the coercivists, they'll always put out this fake enemy image. I mean, they're they, fake they news. Have to, they have to, right? They, have to. Be like, they really have to because otherwise the state cannot uh, give, basically give off this impression that somehow it's serving some sort of useful function to us. Because sometimes they'll make the public goods argument about public utilities and public roads and public, 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 whatever the hell. But then other times it's more of like a national security type argument, isn't it? We have to protect you from the boogeymen outside the borders that. We're building walls on to probably actually more keep you in than anything else. Like you're on this tax plantation. But of course, you know, if, you know, I, you know to, to paraphrase one guy, uh, to see the farm is to leave it. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what Rayo was kind of, was really kind of promoting with Vanu, uh, the Vanu strategy is that, yeah, once you see the farm, you leave it. You see that servile society. I mean, that's really the reason to kind of, you know, that's the importance of import-export, like was mentioned in that earlier, uh, that other episode, too. Or I think we'll get to that, right? Yeah, yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be next week. Uh, yeah, that'll be next week, yeah. Right, the, sur the sur that's a little bit of preview. Yeah, the servile society, right? Because the servile society basically is promoting all these enemy myths and all that to justify the state, to justify institutionalized coercion. And so all these little coercivists basically go to the state and try to use it as their own personal billy club to basically attack their uh, perceived uh, opponents, which tend to be other coercivists, the rival gangs of looters. I mean, that's kind of how this little game works. I mean, that that's a broad overview. But yeah, I see I see what Ray was kind of getting at here uh, in terms of pointing out the hypocrisy of, of the system itself. And he's right, too, about the technological angle of it in the, in the second to last paragraph about, like, look at the inventions of the market versus the inventions of the state. And yeah, that kind yeah, of that kind of tells you a lot, just just without even getting to any sort of philosophical stuff, just those pure examples. You can't really deny that. I don't think the free market came up with 
you know, Harrier jets or drone or, 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 you know, drones that, you know, the UAVs that bomb a well, Pakistani yeah, it was, wedding. It was, it was the, uh, it was the, uh, the private, the public private partnership, you know, the, the fascism, the uh, military industrial complex, I would say, but yeah. Right. And, and by the way, anything that is actually genuinely created by the free market, the state tries to grab that stuff too and twist it to their own ends. Like, I mean, yeah, well, you have telephones. Well, then next thing you know, you have dragnet wiretapping by the NSA. You have, um, not to get into certain elements of this, but let's just say like like GMOs, for instance, gen- genetically modified organisms. Well, like it or hate it, the problem is that once the, that kind of stuff's been copyrighted and then you have going into all those intellectual property issues and all of that kind of stuff, which actually is the monopoly that, you know, it's the ripoff that dare not speaks its name. That's what copyright is. But unfortunately, it is constitutional. Uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting too. So if you invent something and then you get a trademark or a patent or a copyright on it, and then, you know, that almost kind of makes innovation impossible. And that's itself a further infringement against or uh, imposition against the free market and And, interference. And, and, you know, and the the state will oftentimes, you know, buy the, buy the patents and the trademarks from these, you know, these private entrepreneurs. So, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there, there, yeah, there, there, there is that, uh, where they have the exclusive right to use them and no one else, no one else can. Right. Um, but, uh, I, I think we should, we should start to conclude because i want to i want to say this before i ever get it you know just like kind of just a, this brief overview so uh so he starts off by defining his terms which he's he's, he's really he's, he's he's usually really really good at so I, I think that's that's important to point out then the issues come with uh well you know is his, his 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 list of the uh, rival gangs of looters i don't think is too bad i mean it's it, it may, there might be some, some some quibbling here and there but i mean yeah it, it's not too bad uh, but uh, what gets worse is the fact that uh, some of these uh, some of these terms he uses for rival gangs gangs of looters could also double as the people he calls libertarians. Uh, but before that point, uh, he makes uh, a really astute observation about uh, public schooling back in uh, back in the uh, in the sixties, uh, which a lot of people probably didn't. Uh, <laughs> help. I, 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 when was the uh, Department of Education created? I think it was the nineteen seventies, wasn't it? It was. So it might have might have even been before the uh, before the creation of the Department of Education. Uh, but but anyways. Uh, so he he makes that a pretty astute observation, uh, you know some some good uh, some uh, some good dialogue on the radical right and the radical left, and then things turn to uh to turn to, to kind of garbage to put it to put it uh, nicely, <sighs> which we we've already covered. I won't go into that, but but yeah, again, and this is something I kind of noticed, noticed Kyle is the fact that you know like the states' rights people could be decentralists. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, the communitarians are definitely you know the the more of the socialist variety. Uh, I mean the, the 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 overlaps between between the lists are are, are not uh are not yeah good. yeah and who knows maybe he thought he was drawing a distinction between some types versus other types but honestly man I just you know, to sound like Sam it Cl- wasn't he didn't he did he didn't go like if he was trying to do that and maybe he was uh, he didn't go enough into it I mean no. there, there needed to be more said yeah and so at the risk of sounding like Sam Conkin you know I I just don't see it so. Um, I will agree with you that I think Rayo took an article that really needed some more work, and it was really more in its draft form. And the conclusion, the cl- cl- the concluding uh, paragraphs were definitely fantastic on their own merits. Yeah. But the actual examples being used, and 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 even the, even the thing with the felons, it's like, yeah, I mean, victimless crimes, much like, come on, man. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm trying to remember when, like, the- like all, all he had to do was just like, uh, uh, in, in that felon section, uh, felons who personally coerce others, uh, not counting victimless crimes. Like that would have, you know, that would have just kind of like cleared that right up or not. So, yeah. Uh, like something, something like th- there, it really wouldn't have taken much to make this, to make this like, like to, obviously it would still have some issues, but it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take a whole lot to, to really, you know, kind of take this from like, uh, if we're going to use like, uh in public education like we're gonna go on the grading scale going from like a, a d to like a c plus like uh that really wouldn't have taken much <laughs> no no and that's why i said i, I really get it got kind of get the feeling that libertarians and coercivists was an article really in its draft form that i think was probably just rushed to publication to be perfect i mean that honestly ladies and gentlemen that's the impression i'm getting and so yeah well, that that and also keep in mind that he was in uh at 67 yeah i think he was in his uh poly uh, poly uh polyethylene uh a10 or polypropylene a10 at this time typing on a typewriter so uh th- th- there are a lot of factors that come into play uh obviously this doesn't you know negate anything that he's d- anything else that he's done but this is we're, we're kind of you know i guess could it be like a rhetorical analysis of uh of, of his article I, I i don't know but uh but anyways we're you know we're just we're, we're presenting you with one of the very outside of his book and you know uh one or two other places I mean, 
it was pretty. This is pretty much all that's uh, <laughs> all that's all that's available of his work. So, so yeah, just thought we'd uh, we present that to you guys, and, and you guys can obviously make your own decisions. But uh, there are obviously some really really good parts of this too. But uh, any closing thoughts, Kyle? Yeah, I would just say this is that I think you know being skeptical and trying to be fair about it too. You know, I I know some people use the term judgmental and a negative you know negative connotation. I don't know, man. I make judgments all the time. Um, but I'd like to think that I try to give people a fair shake before I, you know, reach a conclusion about something. And yeah, like, I mean, I've made all sorts of judgments about, about Vanu in terms of, you know, it's, it's, it's really good salient points and how accurately, you know, it describes, uh, you know, at least all the situation I'm going through right now, right? Statism, right? Same as, same as you, same as Jim Bob down the street and, and the listeners, of course. I, I want to meet this infamous Jim Bob. Yeah, well, I may, may <laughs> well, I don't know. Jim Bob is the everyman. He's nobody, but if you're nobody too, then he then you're somebody to him or however the phrase goes. But yeah. Oh, uh, again, first person, second person, third person, right? Anywho, uh I, I would just say this. I think I think this would actually be more of a cautionary tale, actually. I think that's what I want to leave the listeners with. This is really this article of his is really more of a cautionary tale. And I think there was a reason maybe John Fisher didn't put it in the Vanu book. Actually, I, I was also kind of thinking that too. Like, why uh, isn't this yeah. in section one? And maybe John Fisher looked at it and realized, yeah, I think Ray kind of screwed up here. Uh, so that's maybe why it was left out of the Vanu book, which itself was just an anthology of, of Rayo's articles because it's not exactly as good. The Libertarians and Coercivist article is not exactly as good as anything else in the Vanu book. Not even. So close. I think John Fisher actually, if if I'm trying to think like how he would as an editor, I think John Fisher as the editor of of the of the Vanu book, I think made a very wise choice in in leaving this out, uh, because yeah, I mean that last part of it's good, but then the rest of it's just kind of like needed some more work. And again, to be fair, you, you're right for mentioning Rayo is like typing on a typewriter, like out in the woods or something. So. And this was also pre-internet, right? So it's not like you could just hop on Wikipedia like I do a lot, probably too much. I can't. You can just hop on Wikipedia and do some fact checking, or not even necessarily fact checking, but checking oh, out. Yeah, and, and also, and also, and also, keep in mind too. This is, uh, oh, I guess it was published in January sixteenth, uh, nineteen sixty-seven. So it probably took a month, like probably a month to, uh, uh, to get in there. So I mean, he was using his polyethylene A ten. Poly, I don't remember if it's polyethylene or polypropylene A ten. You, it's close enough. You guys get it. But uh, uh, consider also, like there may have been some external factors, such as you know, being cold as hell. Out there in the uh, you know uh, in the uh, Siskiyou region, uh, the uh, uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California, it probably got probably got pretty cold. So I mean, that, I mean that's kind of a dumb dumb external factor. But anyways, I mean there, there's there's a lot of things to think about. We don't know. Uh, I mean we can't really necessarily we can't necessarily call up on it on the telephone and say, hey bro, why'd you publish this article? You shouldn't have. <laughs> there's, there's no way to do that. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, considering the technology he had available at the time and the access to information he had at the time, and that he was really just kind of birthing a lot of this, a lot of this stuff just from conversations he had with people or whatever, like books, like actual physical books. I'm not talking about an ebook. I mean, like physical books you could actually touch, right? The technology at the time. That I, I, I can't really fault him too much if, yeah, because he couldn't, like I said, he couldn't just go on Wikipedia and double check, say, the article on polyarchy or the article on like some of these different, you know, category and like double check. Like there were, there was no way to do any sort of open set of open source intelligence sharing, which, which Wikipedia does facilitate despite people make, uh, making accusations against the website for biases or the moderators anyway. Um, there, there's no way to have any sort not to, to facilitate an easier open source intelligence sharing. Like the best he could do is like, what, maybe go to the library the public library. Ooh, there's another public one, right? You could probably go to the public library. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if he'd catch catch Rayo in a public library. Pro I hope not. <laughs> you might catch, although although not to be too not not to be totally annoying, but technically you could catch Claire Wolf there at least back in the day. But yeah, because she she was kind of like begrudgingly liking the public libraries because it saved her money. But yeah, I mean whether it be like an actual private bookstore or it's a public library, either version, you know, like. Yeah, it, you actually have to like travel there and then get the books out. And if it's private, you have to pay for it. 
you know, it's it's not the same thing as hopping on the internet, go type, 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 you know, into the URL and whether it's Wikipedia or a different website and, and you know, fact checking, although there's also a lot of misinformation, disinformation too. So you'd still have to be careful and still be skeptical, but it's not like Rayo could do that back in the day, you know, so the access no, to information no, he had not. is dramatically limited than what you and I have access to now. So in terms of like critiquing this particular article of his that didn't even make it into the Vanu book, like, yeah, we can do yeah, like, yeah, I mean, you and I can disagree with with Rayo about this, but at the same time, like I'm having a hard time, like, I don't feel angry about it. Like with a lot of other people I criticize. No, no yeah, for yeah, whenever it comes to people, you know, uh, uh bas like trying to bastardize like the ideology I adhere to, I get really pissed off about that. But for for this one, like like Ray Rayo's a Rayo's a yeah, Rayo's a little different than obviously he was uh uh yeah he, he he's definitely a different sort of fellow and he was actually out there doing things so you know if he if he mischaracterizes or gets something wrong about the ideology that i adhere to so be it i mean yeah we, we've already we've already ran through the critiques uh water yeah, up the I, ducks I, I, back. I think you're right water yeah, up yeah. the ducks back is what i'm really getting at very good very good so uh any other closing thoughts no that that was it just water off the ducks back Water off a duck's butt. Maybe I'll name the episode number. <laughs> but uh, anyways, very good. So uh, uh, thanks so much for tuning into the Vonnie Podcast. Find us at VonniePodcast.com. As Kyle mentioned, next week we'll be discussing what Rayo called import-export, as well as the state of servile society, both extremely important uh, aspects of Vonnie. I did want to mention, though, tomorrow I will come into, uh, uh, into possession of two of John Fisher's books, the editor of uh, Vonnie. Uh, one of them is titled Uninhabited Ocean Islands, which I'm really looking forward to reading. It's got some good stuff. It's a five star review, five star, five star reviewed on Amazon, and then uh, another one of his books, "Last Frontiers on Earth: Strange Places Where You Can Live Free." Obviously, old books, probably some stuff to uh, to, to actually pr probably not probably all of it not applicable to today. But anyways, I'm gonna read them and uh, we'll discuss them on future episodes if they uh, if they are useful. So, uh, in the meantime, have a terrific week and best of luck in your journey in becoming a Vonnieman. We'll talk to you later. Podcast dot com.